like that. But then uh, I, I was, I guess, uh, then, you know, fast forward then two years after, like, uh, I think just, just, it's just also the right timing that I, uh, I go and count, eh, so I got really started for two years already. So um, then, of course, something happened. <laughs> so it's actually near end of the year, I got some, uh, I would say, matters with the with the, the court lah. So I have to go and settle with the government and stuff like that. So it's um, some sense I know it was gonna come. It's just that it just comes, right? You you don't know when it, it, they send you a thing and then you're gonna start dealing with it. So uh, what happened was that I for some reason I received the notice very late. So I only have like I think two days to settle this, like to find a lawyer and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> Daniel was on the first on my list actually. For well, then I I saw I was running on the list and tried calling and then uh, you know I mean where I work at I I thought I know a lot of lawyers. I mean I came from law firms actually also. So so the thing is uh, the thing is I spoke to my lawyers friends and all this. No nobody can really help me actually. And then I I called Daniel and you know Daniel said the first thing was that uh, you know just send me the things. Uh, let's see how we can deal with it and stuff like that. Yeah, but most of my other lawyer friends are just like, no, you know, I, I can't help. This, I don't think I can help at all. So it's just, uh, so it's, I, I would say that sort of gave me a big relief also at that time when I, when I you know, found Daniel and then uh, Daniel was actually um, very quick to say that, you know, it's, uh, this one I think we can handle, but, uh, you know, let's meet and then talk again and stuff like that. So then that happened, and then over the past few months, I've been dealing with it. It's quite heavy. <laughs> Actually, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not only the financial penalty, I think, but more than that is, is, is going to court, I think. That usually I take care of people, I advise people, hey, it's okay, you know, like you have to deal with things and stuff like that. But personally, going through it is, is, uh, is really the tough few months I go through. Like, few, then never, never thought I have to go through that, you know, kind of thing, right? So, um, actually, I was telling Daniel that they, we just had our almost like the last hearing really, and uh, one thing I I realized is that I, I feel that actually God, um, I know this was gonna come. It's just a matter of when, and then I feel that God put it in front of me and tell me it's like you know I I shouldn't um, try to not try to go around it or just don't think about it and stuff like that, but to face it, and in fact, I feel a lot more relief now. I know it's not easy, but then, you know, happens, hap it happens, it happens, I'm going to deal with it, right? I tell, I tell people a lot about that. <laughs> for, me, for me to experience it, this is quite a first time, I would say. And, um, and I feel, so to a lot of people, this is like a very big, like from in my line, it's a very big uh, thing. But to me, actually, I felt a certain relief. Yeah, so I, I feel that this is, uh, I mean, I, I, I would say uh, quite blessed, huh? that I have to go through this and then, in some sense, I feel different also. Yeah. Thank you. I find it quite ironic. Uh, he's saying that he's being, he feels quite blessed when actually he needs to pay a fine. And the fine is, it's not $5. But, but when you have to face something and God is with you, things are different, right? So I, I find it very interesting. And if not for this, he wouldn't have connected with me. He wouldn't have come to church. He wouldn't have come to sit here. And at that day, Silas was um, speaking. And uh, he was so impressed with Silas. I don't know why he's impressed with Silas. When I speak, he doesn't say he's impressed. But anyway, he came back and he said, there's something about this church is authentic. I said, I, I don't know how else to run a church. A church should be authentic, right? When we come here, we say that, look, we're having some problems, financial, physical level. Let's pray. And then we allow God to come through. So when he came, and then when he, he and then I, I, I find it very interesting that he says that when he comes in and he needs to face the something, uh, some of us were in, in court with him a couple of weeks back, uh, he has to, I won't say more, but he has to stand down there before a judge. Not funny, yeah. It's like you're in the dock and then you have to face the music. That's exactly what he has to go through. Uh, we, don't know the, we don't know the sentencing yet, but the, it will come on the, I think, 17th of April. But this man is here, and he started coming back to church, and he's uh, also joined the cell group that we, we started uh, in Silas's house, that young cell group. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he's still young. And uh, 
actually, the fact of the matter is, Joey, if he didn't go through whatever he's going through now, he won't be back here. So I told him, if that is what it takes, Brian, if that's what it takes for someone to come to church, then that's what it takes. Because God is always in the business of getting his people to come back. So I'm, I'm very encouraged. I, I, that day I did a marvellous thing after cell group, sent him all the way home. It was raining some more. Were you so touched when I sent you home? <laughs> I'm so, so touched. I said, my goodness, raining. I was thinking, hey, you know, Angela, the, the meeting, you know, this uh, Silas, you know, all these people stay, don't know where, stay you know, near Great World for me to send him back to Tampines, raining some more. I was just supposed to drop him just the MRT station, rainy, but then, you know, the compassion within me just rose. That's in MI, I'll send you back to Tampines. Yeah, TG, disbursements, huh? Are you from a law firm? Uh, but, but sometimes, it, and we said, is, isn't it the case? It's the little, little things that matter, right? Hey, Xiao, come. See you. Come. Another client. Come, sit down. Uh, sit with my other client, so sit down. Uh. <laughs> hey, they're not laughing at you, uh, steady. Uh. They're laughing at him. No, I'm not laughing at you, but. But as we come, I told Xiao to come. He's also a client. He says, I said, he says actually he's a grab rider and he needs to um, earn monies, correct? Yeah, I heard that in grab driving, you have, have a ranking on, you know. Do you know that at 8 a.m., today's uh, Channel News Asia article, at 8 a.m., everybody gets all the assignments because 8 a.m., all rushing for breakfast, McDonald's, you call here, you call there. But after that, it trickles down, you know. Do you know that from 11 a.m., it can be no assignment? And uh, Stephen Chia, I think, went for two days with the guy. He earned, uh, one day, he earned $17.70. Then on a better day, he earns $37.40, 10 hours down, down there, whatever. Because you have to have right, uh, a ranking. So first, maybe you start in, maybe you don't know what, what diamond, what sapphire, then emerald, then don't know what become diamond. But if you're not at the top ranking, they don't give you. You, you, don't, you, you don't get some of the appointments and, and there's no priority. So I said to Xiao, I called him yesterday because I just connected with him. Welcome, please connect with him again. I said, just come. I said, come today, although today, if you are a grab rider, Saturday, 5 p.m., is it prime time? What do you think? It is prime time, but he's still here. So my friend, we'll pray for you later. And that is, can you remind me later, Gun, to pray for these people? If we do nothing today, we'll pray for him so that we pray for your, whatever you need to preach from 70 April, and I want to pray for you as well. But isn't that what church is all about? Then we become for real. Uh. And I can talk with uh, Wing and say, hey, Wing, uh, there's this colleague uh, of yours uh, that join me for a while now, coming back to join you. Can we share her? She worked for you, also worked for me. And then we connect together. But I think that's life. As we, as we evolve, as we come together, relationships connected. Uh, we had a marvellous cell group um, dinner on, on, was it Thursday night? Gun, Mazai, Salas and I, we had a meeting with her. Uh, Malcolm and the rest, and, and what better place to go than to go to Gan's auntie's place? The ex-girlfriend. Good dinner, affordable rates, and we had a wonderful time just to fellowship. I think this is, this is church for you as we come together. So I want to just always tell people, and I connected with our friend Alex. Alex, right? I met him outside the toilet. Very dangerous to meet me outside the toilet. I, I cornered him. I said, when are you coming to cell group? I say I know that your wife is 135. We are studying very hard, right? I know, I know. But how about the husband and the children connect to the cell group first? And then he says, the wife, the wife how? I say the wife will come one day. But why don't you get it started first? You're the head of the house. You say if it's done, it is done. And then we take it from there. Okay? I want to just encourage all of us as we come before the Lord that the Lord is doing something. I'm in the, in the midst of doing the book of Exodus. I want to talk about the theology of work. And today, uh, the, the title of this message today is Keep Working. It's a need of us to understand what working means in the eyes of God. So if you have your Bibles open, go with me to Exodus 1 and Exodus 2. First slide, I want to tell you that whatever we do, I always tell people, can we please, whatever we say, whatever we do when we read the Bible or the testimonies, can we try to find Jesus within whatever testimony, if we, if we, if for example, when we, when we go to court and I see people like Dennis, actually Dennis is God, you know why? Because of some corporate offences, then he said, I will take it for my, for my clients, that's why he's in court. Then I said, you sound like Jesus, man. 
because it is he who has to face the music, not his clients. I say, very good. If that is what you need to go through, I'm sure Jesus will be there for you. But whatever we do, can we find Jesus in everything? Whatever we talk about, are we able to find Jesus? And you find the Jesus, the precursor of Jesus in the Old Testament because the New Testament, Jesus comes in a life form, right? But the Old Testament, dime in a dozen, whatever is said, whatever it is precursor, so to speak, you should find the character of Jesus and the mention of Jesus, the prophecies that will tell you that Jesus is going to come. So in the Old Testament, everything should be set up and everything, every aroma, every knowledge, every hint, every whatever we talk about, it should point you to Jesus. And that should still be the case when we discuss about God even today. Whatever we do, I want to pre just tell us, can we just try to find Jesus in everything? Second slide. And now we're not talking about weenie, but we're talking about wax. Wax are all these World Cup, when you watch World Cup, right? Wax are all these people, all those uh, famous uh, wives and girlfriends of the footballers, they term this, called, this thing called wax, not exactly the most complimentary. But today, I want to talk about a few people in the book of Exodus that are women that I will say after God. I want to change the word wax to women after God. And in Exodus 1, you see dime a dozen in Exodus 2 as well, people that I thought were interesting. And some of them, and I would say in this parenthesis, and these people, they were doing the work of God. And actually, some of them did the work of God without even knowing. And I want to go through with you. And sometimes, I want to tell you, you know, sometimes, all the time, Joey, God uses everyone. Did God use Pharaoh, who, who later gunned, and I'm sure Silas and Royston in the, in, the, in the weeks to come in the book of Exodus, did God use Pharaoh? Yes. Did God harden the heart of Pharaoh? Think about it. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, but I suggest to you, Pharaoh hardened his own heart first. Okay? Don't think of God being such a wicked person, so to speak. Huh? But it was Pharaoh whose heart was hardened, and after that, God allowed his heart to be hardened even further. But in relation to doing the work of God, sometimes you, you must understand something. God can use anything. I keep saying it. God can use you. If you don't want to be used, God will use somebody else. But God can use a donkey. God can use a light. God can use a firm. God can use everything. And in amongst the human beings, God can use even a pre-believer. God can use anything. So as we look at the theology of work, I want you to understand that God can use anything. Today, I want to focus a few of the people that I thought was interesting in the woman that we look at in Exodus 1 and 2. God will use anybody, anything, anytime He deems fit. I start with a first pair of women, and last week I talked a bit about it. If you go to Exodus 1 to 16, 116 and 117, there were two Hebrew midwives. What happened that was at the time the Israelites were being oppressed, the Israelites were not having a good time. The Egyptians found them to be a threat. And later, I will, I will jump back with and, and tell you why the Egyptians found them to be a threat. But for the time being, as we talk about the women who are doing God's work, whether they do it or not, I have a first pair for you. Their names are found in 1 Exodus 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, what are their names? Sifra and Pua. I find it very interesting. It is the king of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt, but you don't know the king's, the name of the king. Do you find the name of the king here? It just says king of Egypt. Do you find the name of the pharaoh? We don't know. We have to guess. I think the, the pharaoh could be Ramesses number two. But here, the king of Egypt, the name is not known. The pharaoh of Egypt, you also don't know the name. But the name of the midwives, do you know? You know. I find that very interesting. And in verse 15, you see that these were the Hebrew midwives, the names of Sifra and Pua. When you're helping the Hebrew woman doing childbirth on the dairy stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let him live. It is the king. She how? I'm the king here, right? I say to the two of you later, anybody who's wearing orange pants, I want you to tell them to take off the pants and never wear it again. <laughs> Do it because I'm the king. But that is whose will? That's the will of the Lao Hiao here, correct? The king. When you look at it, and I thought about it, it is interesting. When you are helping the Hebrew woman during childbirth on the delivery, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Who wanted this done? Answer? The king of Egypt. Is the king of Egypt God? No. The king of Egypt is, well, maybe almost like demigod status, right, during that time. But he is no God. He's a human being. That was his will. Is that God's will? To murder the Hebrew firstborn, the boy? Is that God's will, Dennis? I don't think so. In verse 17, the midwives 
heard from the edict and the decree of King Egypt in verse 70 it says, the midwives, however, that tells you the answer already, right? However, they heard the decree of men, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. I wonder whether sometimes in the marketplace when we work, we are so frozen or so... And there are a lot of temptations in the marketplace, right? Sometimes you need to deal with bribes, corruption. Singapore, uh, uh, if you don't know, uh, it's not the least corrupt country in the world. There is corruption. It's not zero corruption, it's not high corruption, but there is corruption. There is corruption. Which is why in courts we still have people being charged here and there, right? And some of them are government officials. Not some of them are working for whatever company and, and they get charged. I, I will stop there. But the midwives feared God, did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. That's exactly what they did. And ta-da-da, what happened to them? They were found out. But first and foremost, the slide tells you, secular orders, the king of Egypt wanted the boys to be dead. They defied the king. They ignored and did the exact opposite. Next slide. What did they do? They decided to let the children, the boys live. They were found out. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this, Winnie? Why? Uh? Midwife, why have you let the boys live? Did I not say that anybody wear orange pants, you tell them to take off their pants? Why didn't you do anything about it? What's your answer? Verse 19, the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Can I ask mothers, Shireen, is this true? Tiffany, next time mother, can I ask you? Answer, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before. That means before you reach there, midwives already delivered. It's like sliding, you know, the, 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 the boy comes, shh. When I reached there, bo liao. Angela, was it so fast? When you delivered? I saw my wife deliver Elliot actually quite fast. Struggle a bit. Honestly. She was the one with the, the, the oxygen. I was the one. I wanted to faint. It was very fast, like a slide. Do you think this is true? The answer in verse 18. Wing. Shireen, answer. Is this a lie? Or is it a half lie? Don't know. PG, you sure not? Your mother? I suggest to you, it is possibly a lie. Lawyers, I know, always try to bring. I'm not sure myself. Possibly a lie, right? Eh? And assuming if it's a lie, Brian, is it justified? What does the word of God say? Thou shall not. Brian, before I baptize you, oh no, God will baptize you. Thou shall not lie. Is this a lie? And if it is a lie, is it justified? Wow, today, tough question. Who wants to answer the question? Justified? Justified? Silas, Silas yes. June, justified? Huh? What, you say justified, justified? Cop out. <laughs> Ex-girlfriend, justified? Ken. What is the basis, therefore, of justification. What do we look at? Lawyers will look at men's rear. <laughs> Joe saw that. He says, is this a correct? Uh, men's rear. Is it men's wear or men's what? Men's rear in Latin or whatever, next time to criminal law. It is the what? What you think. You understand? Men's rear is, if you check, it's Latin, I think. Men's rear is what you intend or what you think about. Or in layman terms, What's your motivation? You don't know what her lie or whatever Chinese. Where are you coming from when you did or said what you said? Okay? I'm not sure whether it's like, maybe it's true, right? uh, Hebrew woman, the thing slide down. Or uh, Egyptian woman, take a long time. It's not when you come, you stick and kill the kid. I don't know. But I, I, I may find it a bit hard to believe. But take it as its base value if it's a lie. I say to you, this is justified because if you don't do that, what happens? You participate in the killing of the Hebrew firstborn. Are you with me? 
I'm not, please, uh, don't get out of this place. And then it comes out of YouTube, everybody says, Daniel Go says, can go and lie. Then every day go and lie here, lie there, lie here, lie there, lie, lie everywhere. My law firm name, my, my first partner, her name is Lai, Lai Chin Chin. The second guy, I used to have one guy, his name is Wee, W-E-E. My name is Go, G-O-H. Can you imagine we don't call ourselves characters, we call ourselves Lai, we go, or we go lie, go and lie, but <laughs> quite funny, yeah. But do we actually lie sometimes because there's some justification? Next slide. How about X5? Those people lied when they were told. But you can, I don't have time to read chapter X, uh, X chapter 5 for you. But their lie was for their own motivation. They were zapped immediately. They died on the spot. Because the motivation was for self-preservation or there was greed. How about Joshua 2, when Rahab, the prostitute, hit the spies? Remember the spies? Not spice girls, are the spies. God wanted to preserve them. Did Rahab have to lie in order to preserve their lives? They did. Closer to home now. How about, what's that woman, Cory Ten Boom? How about those people who hit the Jews when the Nazis were after them? If the Gestapo come to you, Summer, this is your house, is it? Do you have any Jews with you? I saw one show, no, I don't know which one. Is it Inglorious? Don't know what of the bastard that, that sorry, not that, but the show, the title. It was a very good show. In the show, the, they were hiding the Jews. The Jews were actually the Gestapo fan. The fella really looks damn scary, man. And he was walking around. You know where the Jews, the Jews were hiding underneath the wooden platform. They're just keeping quiet. They couldn't say. And then the hosts have to pretend that, oh no, we're not hiding anything. But they were all hidden there. Are you entitled to lie in those circumstances? What do you think? Can I leave you as a thought? Thou shall not lie is the norm, not the exception. You understand? It, or, what, or is it the other way around? But thou shall not lie is the general proposition. But there will be times, not there will be, there could be times whereby there's some justification. As we work, I hope we don't have to deal with these style of things. But in this case, it was quite clear that the Hebrew midwives, if you ask me, assuming this to be a lie, they were justified. The intention or motivation was good. Verse 20, 21, So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, He gave them families of their own. So question, were the midwives rewarded after that? Answer is yes. But I want to tell you something. They were not rewarded for their lies. They were rewarded for their work for God. Is that okay? God didn't say, well done, good and faithful liar. You are rewarded with a family. No, God rewarded them because they did the work of God. Tiffany, is that okay? God didn't say, oh, you lied, super. I'm happy that you lied. Lie on. No, lied, but they were rewarded not for their lies, but for their work. And because the, what were they being rewarded for? They were rewarded for the work. They were rewarded because they feared God. That is what verse 21 says. So in our theology of work, when we work, is it the fear of God or the fear of man? What motivates you? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Today, TG dot form. But the fear of man, TG, traps you. That's, I think, Proverbs 24. The, the, the word is ensnare you. If you fear man, what happens? You get trapped. But when you fear God, it's the beginning of wisdom. So as we work, as we, th as we think about the theology work, can I just leave it as a thought as we go down the work? Next person I want to see. Next slide, please, Leon. The sister of Moses. The sister of Moses is interesting. If you go to me with Exodus 2, go to me with Exodus 2, will you? Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. Remember, we first talked about the fact that when, when they came together, there were the 12 tribes, right? In Exodus 1, the naming of the tribes. Levites were one of the 12. Levites, you always say, are the people who worshippers of God, right? Let's call them the musicians, the, the, the Levites. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, the son named Moses. When she saw that she was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When cannot, Tahan cannot hide her anymore, she got a basket coated with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Verse 4, this is the sister of Moses. The sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to the brother. Question, older sister or younger sister? Answer, Sabrina? I think older, right? Should be, ah. Uh? Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and attendants were walking along the riverbank, saw the basket, sent a female slave to get it, opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This, Pharaoh's daughter says, is one of the Hebrew babies. What did the daughter, Moses' sister do? She was quite smart. 
And I hope in the marketplace, you're always very smart. We look from afar and observe first. Don't talk so much. You understand? The decree is to kill your brother, you know. Your mother decided that three months old cannot hide anymore. Hide three months already. It's like under the wooden plank can be there forever, right? Three months have been there because their father's crying all the time. Get out. Moses stopped crying, stopped crying. You try telling your three months old to stop crying. No way, right? So let go onto the rounds, whatever. Guys, is the river now a safe place? Is it like uh, some, uh, uh, some Venice a uh, 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 river, very safe, whatever. The river now is full of boya, crocodiles waiting to chomp. But she had no choice, let it go. And as she went, the sister was watching from afar. What did the sister do? Number one, the sister observed and looked from afar. What else did she do? After that, she had a plan. What was the plan? She saw, as I read to you, that the Pharaoh's daughter was going to pick up the brother. Then the sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? I thought that was brilliant. What a brilliant execution. Shireen, let's say it's Zachary. Uh. Is Zach here? Uh. So big now. Uh. Last time, uh, three months old. Oh, put down Kalang River. Go down Kalang River, chow, right? Kalang River, chow, chow, chow. Tiffany, stop riding. And then Tiffany, oh, Tiffany, the sister comes. Knowing that this Zachary is going to go don't know where and then pick up by Winnie the Queen. Oh, Queen. Winnie the queen picks up and then what do you do? You go to Winnie and say, shall I ask one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Who do you have in mind to nurse your brother? The mother. Lah. But you don't go to Winnie and say, shall I ask my mother to nurse her, my brother for you? That's stupid, right? Now in the market, please better be smart. The questions and the framing also very good. Here, very polite. This is how people learn. The Bible is so much wisdom. Shall I ask and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? So polite. So smart. Talk nicely. Angela, when I want something for you, do I talk nicely to you? Angela, shall we go and do this for God? How you say no? She how I say, shall you come? When you come, can we pray for you? That's why you come, right? I don't care, just come. You will come? Won't. Nah. But some people, I stay at that, they still come. But shall I go? It's very wise. Shall I go in the marketplace? Do we know how to talk like that? Shall I go? And Tiffany, you never say that the person that's going to look after Zachary is your mother. No? Because if you told Winnie that, Winnie may say, wow, ask your mother. La. Aren't you all Hebrews? In fact, my father say you want to kill, all, kill your brother. You still tell me to punk say. No, man. So very smart. Her plan was going to be executed and she had all the gentleness and she was smart as a serpent. The choice of words were very good. And then she made the recommendation. The recommendation actually is for the mother to look after the son. I thought that was brilliant. That is work for you when we, when we work. Can we be smart? Some people say when we work, we cannot be cunning. Who say cannot be cunning? Ah? Cannot be crafty when we work. Do you have to tell that the person that you want to work to look after is your mother? Tiffany, no need. Correct? But you just have to be wise as a serpent. Serpent, very cunning. Uh, but don't forget to be innocent as a dove. Isn't that the word of God? Shall I ask? Of course, Winnie will say, yes, Go. You think Winnie is going to look after the son for you? Uh, no, Winnie is very hardworking. But can you imagine the queen? The queen is going to say no. The queen says, yes, go. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him and I'll pay you. Champion, right? You let go. Can you imagine how God works? I, when I read this, it's crazy. It's like you already, Shireen, you're prepared to let your son go down the Kalang River knowing that you may not see her, him, correct? When, when the mother, Moses' mother, let Moses down the river, river now, infested with crocodiles and whatever else, do you not think that she thinks that she may not see the sun again? What do you think? The answer is yes. She's prepared to let him go. Hopefully, God, can you just take care of him? Let go. Not knowing that actually God had other plans. That's the theology of what you need to know. When you do whatever, God has his own plan. You just have to flow with the flow. And when you flow, God's plan will come to fruition. Isn't that beautiful? I thought this story is amazing. And when I read it, I was just uh, so, so, so marveled at it. And then guess what? 
You let your son go shooting thinking that he may die, but you guess what? You get to look after your, your, your son, and who's paying? The state is paying. We need is paying. Take this baby, nurse him for me, and I'll pay you. I, 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 I found that amazing. <laughs> really amazing. Because that was, would not have been in contemplation of Shirin, thinking that you will lose the daughter, lose the son. It's the mother and daughter combining together. The sister also very smart. Huh, Tiffany? The Cantonese call what? Sing Mok. Correct? Look from afar, look, and then know when to strike, then time to strike. Ask the right question. Shall I go? No, no, no. Don't take Winnie. Don't touch. That one is my brother. Let him go. No, you, that fellow will be dead. But shall I go, Winnie? Queen Winnie. Is it okay that we come to your house on Saturday? Karen and I got no place to go. We will just bring a bottle of wine. But is it okay we come and visit you? But I thought, how can how? How to say no? And then go down there, silence will come out, everything sui sui. But as marketplace people, can I ask us the theology of work? Whatever you do, yet at the same time, on a higher level, you know that whatever you do, God orchestrates and He'll put the dots together. Does it make sense to you? So it makes sense for you to come to this year. Actually, it doesn't make sense. I don't know why you're here. No. Actually, when I asked you to come and say, I didn't think you would come. Because if I were you, I'll be working out there, 5 to 6 p.m. earlier than money. Correct? But you're here. And we will pray that by you being here, if not, Silas will give $100 and say, God will bless you for being there. Whatever it takes. Mother of Moses. Mother of Moses, her job is to conceive and to bear this child. Verse 2 says, when she saw that he was a, what child? Verse 2, a fine child. God had a plan for Moses. Moses was going to be the one that would liberate the Jews from Egypt. Although later along the way, I'm sure Gan and Sons talk about, he was actually not very willing, but God had a plan for him. He was a fine child. So mothers, when you have a child, God had a plan for you to deliver this child, and this child will be used by God. Is that okay with you? Whatever child God gives, all kinds of children, all shapes and sizes, God has a plan for them. In this case, the plan of God was to use this child, Moses, and the mother saw that he was a fine child. She hid him for three months. Actually, when you hide the child for three months, you're asking for trouble because the decree was when the child comes, he's supposed to die. Correct? She hid him out of the fear of who? The king or fear of God? She hid him for three months. She gets paid to look after the child when your child should be dead. The child actually should be dead. It's either dead by decree when you send down the river or dead because the crocodile would have had a free meal. All accounts, Moses shouldn't have survived. Don't you think so? What do you think, Clarissa? When the child Moses is put down the reed and go down, the chances are he wouldn't have made it. He made it anyway and he made it right to the top as we can see in the book of Exodus. It did, or crocodiles, he would have been dead. But guess what? God had other plans. The theology of work. God's work was to be fulfilled through this man. That's favor, my friend. And Moses, the life of Moses' life, the life of Moses was going to move from favor to flavor. He was going to be the man that God was going to use. But painful, huh? Last part for Moses' child. When the child grew older, Exodus 2.10, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. Shireen, now take Zachary, pass to Winnie, your child, right? You love Zachary, right? Pass to Winnie, and what do you say to Winnie? This is your son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. I, I don't know how she felt, but she took it upon herself, the mother, the biological mother, prepared to release the child when the time was right for the work to be done. I thought that was amazing. Joey, give me your child now. Your child now is my child. I want the child. Give it to me now. Come. Huh? 
the daughter of Pharaoh. Another woman. All the wax are today. Not footballers' wives, but the wax. The women after God. They were going to be doing God's work. The daughter of Pharaoh. The daughter of Pharaoh, question. When the daughter of Pharaoh took Moses, and did she know that this was a Hebrew baby? The word of God says, right? This is one of the Hebrew babies, verse 6. Did she know that the father said every Hebrew baby, the boy is supposed to die? Alex? Your father said, the boy is supposed to die, you keep. Uh. The father is the king of Egypt, you know, the pharaoh. You disobey your father? This is exactly what she did. I don't know what possessed her to do it. But I still don't understand. I don't think she's a believer, right? Yeah, what do you think? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. But she was prepared to disobey the edict from the father. She knew the addict. She knew it's a Hebrew baby. She willfully disobeyed. Clearly, uh, there's no, uh, oh, this is quite grey, Lois. Oh, this is quite grey. Some children you can keep, come not. Hebrew baby, supposed to die. Keep. Was she even God-fearing or aligned with God? Which is why I said what I said. The purposes of God will be fulfilled by anything, anybody, anytime, as God deems it. Do you make sense? God can use anything. God can use even Pharaoh's daughter. And God was going to use Pharaoh and in the months, to, in the weeks to come as you talk about Exodus. Although Pharaoh was a very harsh man, God was going to use him. All the women that you see in Exodus 1, the stars were aligned. They're going to do the work of God. The father's heart was however hardened, not hers. She participated in God's plan to fulfill God's purposes through Moses, the fine child that was raised for such death. And if there's any theology or work, I want you to leave this with you, and I printed it out for a reason. Hebrews 6.10, God is not unjust. When we all work, whether it was Moses' mother, Moses' sister, or whoever else, the Hebrew midwives, always think about it. When you do God's work, then it's God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. Now, when we work, Sabrina, when we work, God will is just. Remember we talked about justice, Micah? Pursue justice, right? Act justly, love mercy, and walk in purity with God. Micah 6, 8, the anchoring verse for the church for 2023. God is not unjust. God is just. He will not forget your work. Whatever you do, God will not forget it. And when you work, what do you do? Yep, when you work, you do the work such that you will show God's love. You will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him. When you work, Angela, what do you do? You exhibit the love that God has given you and the love you have shown to the Father. How do you give love to the Father? As you have helped His people. Now, when we work, I hope that's the theology work, guys. When we work, all of us, when we work, we know that God is not unjust. He will not forget your work, Nyap. And the love, when you work, Nyap, you're showing Him the love you have. And how do we know there's evidence of your love? You have helped Nyap. When you work, you have helped His people. And you don't stop there. And you continue to help them. Isn't that the theology of work? Welcome, my friend, sister. We have been praying for you. Do you know that this place is saturated with prayer? What time do you come for this? Two plus. I don't want you to think that when we come here, happy, happy, just 4.30. There are people praying since 2 something. Now you know why you're here. There are people praying for this service. And I'm so touched. I never said must pray. Joe is not here. DG, you married well, you understand? You know what? Right? It was Joe and Phyllis who do something. Do something, I'm still sleeping on my, you know, typically Saturday, I don't know about you, Angela. I lie down there, tanting. I... <sighs> People praying. I'm so happy people are praying. Then when I come, I know that that's the presence of God. But as we do God's work, Phyllis, as you come to something, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. And when we work, why do we work? We work because of the love of God, right? And the love you have shown God. And what, how do I know you are loving God? You help His people. I've got people like Silas who come at 4.30. Actually, if you think marketplace, right? He will say, he can say, Hey, I'm a bank country manager. I'm the number one fella. He asked me to play guitar. He asked me to speak already. I'm so tired. Still need to play guitar. 
but he comes anyway because God has spoken to him to do God's work and his job is to make Jasmine, Esther and Karen look good in worship. But as we do the work of God, I want you to anchor yourself, please, to the theology of work as you find in Hebrew 6.10. Is that your theology? You work out your abundant love of God manifesting in you, helping His people and continue to do so. On His part, God is not unjust. His sense of justice will prevail. I flip. Now let's look at the theology of work of the Egyptians. All these people, very good, right? Doing the work of God, whether they're believers or not, including Pharaoh's daughter, the midwives, and met, met, uh, Moses' sister and mother. What do the Egyptians believe in? Look with me in Exodus 1. They believe in Takan. Number one, they saw that the Israelites were becoming more and more. There were a lot of them. A new king, verse 8, Exodus 1, to whom Joseph meant nothing. Problem, huh? When Joseph was helping the Pharaoh, it was a certain Pharaoh. You understand? But then the new Pharaoh came. This new Pharaoh don't know who Joseph is. He doesn't give a crap. Who is this Joseph guy? I don't care. This new king comes and then he says he's got a problem. Look, he says to his people, the Israelites have become too many. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us and leave their country. So what does the new king who doesn't know Joseph and therefore knows, owns, owns, owes no allegiance to Joseph and the Jews, he decides to put slave masters over them, oppress them with forced labour, build Pithom and Ramesses as stores, cities for Pharaoh. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They tore them down. They encircled them. Verse 14, they make their lives bitter with harsh labor. They encircle them. They kick them in their teeth where it hurts. Okay, I will make your life even worse. I will make your lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar. I read in, uh, some part whereby they say that the brick, they, make, they, they made the bricks even heavier. They don't let them use straw. So the bricks were actually not supposed to be so heavy. They make it even heavier. You understand? So it's like, I don't give you the materials. I make your life even harder. I take away whatever is easier for you. I make life harder for you. What do I do? I give you even more work. They make their lives bitter with harsh labor, verse 14, in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work. And in all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. They added more work, and it was non-stop. The Malay, the Malay call in army, Dennis, always come back, wow, kena tekan, man. This lieutenant Silas Lee, uh, jalan uh. Whack us, I know which business. All got the gun. Brian, familiar? Are we like that at work? That's the theology of work of the Egyptians, our friend. That's how they think of work. Oh, work, ah. work is supposed to make you have no time. You know why I make you work so hard? You're already so many of you guys. I better work you so hard. You're my slave, right? I make you work hard so that when you're so shack, you go back, you don't go and pull, create, and create more babies. Correct? I work you harder. Feed you less. The bricks make it heavier. Tekan you. But guess what? That is not what God wants for the Jews. You think you can go against God's work? The Jews became even more and more numerous. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. And God was going to come to save his people. Next slide. Did the Israelites deserve it? Was it their own doing? I'm going to say something I hope is a bit sensitive, but I thought it's interesting and I happened to trend an article in Straits Times a couple of days back. Did the Israelites deserve it? Was it their own doing? Question. Were the Israelites supposed to stay in Egypt for so long? Why did the Israelites go to Egypt? They went to Egypt because they needed the grain, right? And Joseph, the prime minister, what did he do? He supplied the grain. Can I suggest to you, they're not supposed to stay so long. They're supposed to stay. If you have a famine, okay, I'll give you five years. You're supposed to take the grain, go back to where you come from, and with the grain, you build up your own economy, you become self-sufficient. And what did they do? They stayed beyond the five years. In fact, they stayed, what, maybe 400 years. From the end of Genesis to the time of Exodus, 400 years. These people overstayed 395 years. 
sometimes you need to understand uh, when you're not supposed to be at a place, market people, when you're not supposed to be at a place for too long, don't overstay your welcome. Fifth year, okay. Sixth year, okay. This one stay 400 years. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, it's like, for example, let's say uh, you come to my house and then we're supposed to eat and then I go to Winnie's house and then I, I take skin, skin at 10 something, we're still drinking, 11.30, still there and then Winnie's house is going to pop out and then Silas already so fair, the face like no more blood and then Karen still sitting there. Yeah, I talk, talk, talk. 1 a.m. still talking. Yeah, yeah. You're always, always staying, you're welcome. The Egyptians did not want them to stay so long. They stayed. Why? Because the land was fertile. Down there, you got good food. All the crabs, the, the, the siham is very good, very juicy one. Crocodile meat also have. So they overstayed and that's the problem. They became too comfortable. They overstayed and after that, it was God that needed to kick them out after 400 years. Make sense? They were the minority. But guess what? And that's the problem in this society, isn't it? When you are the minority, when you become too big, who will feel threatened? The Majority. Isn't that the problem we have in our society nowadays? Look at the Straits Times article, the next page. The politics of hate, I think it was a couple of days back. The politics of hate fueling majoritarianism across Southeast Asia. I will just quickly read for you some of the things that you may want to know. This is what was happening in Southeast Asia. Let me find the article and I'll quickly just read some parts of it that I thought was pretty interesting. Give me a second. These were across the regions, the idea that the majority feel a sense of grievance or that they are under threat or will soon be threatened by even a small minority. And when the majority feel threatened, what do they do? They assert themselves. They take the form and they strengthen themselves in the form of right-wing religious-based majoritarianism. That is happening in South Asia. Why do we care about South Asia? It is 2 billion people and so forth. We need to pay attention to it. What do these people do? Instilling fear in the majority and the othering in extreme cases, the objectification or dehumanizing of minorities. I think possibly every single religious belief belongs in India, the article says, probably more than any country in the world. So why all of a sudden is there fear? Fear of Muslim, fear of Christian, fear of love jihad, fear of Muslims spreading COVID-19, hate groups and trolling on the media. Love jihad is a widely used conspiracy theory in India that contends that Muslim men lure Hindu women into marriage in order to convert them. All of these Rights have come about because the religious right and the political right have come together, even though they are majority. They've come together. Why? To make the majority feel they're under threat from the minority. The old British saying says, says this, let the majority have its way, but let the minority have the say. And what we're seeing over Southeast Asia today is the minority is not being allowed to have its say. So these are some of the trending issues we have in problem society. Guys, if you're in the church and the only thing you know is the Bible and you don't know how the Bible is applicable now to the current issues, my friend, I don't know what kind of Christian we are. Can we be Christians who know the Bible? You see the problem in Exodus really tell you the majority, we don't be careful. Are we always the majority or the minority? Are you Chinese? Are you the majority? Are you Christian? Are you the majority? So sometimes we could be a majority and sometimes we could be a minority. How do we act? Do we have, as a majority, the theology of work like the Egyptians? Or when we're the minority, are we also quite smart so that the majority don't feel threatened? Do you understand what I'm saying? I have no answers. I'm just telling you these are some of the things the Bible already tells you and the Sweet Science article, I read it yesterday, say, Joe, can we put this up? And Joe asked me, does that mean there's going to be persecution for us Christians? What do you think? But we wear many hats. Sometimes we are a majority, sometimes a minority, right? In the office, are you the minority? Are you the majority? Are you someone who's being oppressed or do you oppress people? What, what hat do you wear and how do you behave? You left Egypt, but has Egypt left you? You've probably heard it before. The Jews 
finally left Egypt. Okay? But after they leave Egypt, the thinking was still that of them still being Egypt. And in the next few weeks, I think we'll talk about it. But that's a problem. When we are always thinking in a certain way. You understand? So comfortable some things. You think in the way as if, oh, in Egypt, oh yeah, everything we have, no, yao feng te feng, yao yu te, you want water, you get one sugar cane, you get one crocodile meat, everything. But when you leave Egypt, suffer, you know. You go to the desert. So as we talk about the theology of work and whatever we go through, what is on our mind? Moses had 40 years a prince. Was he a somebody? Definitely, right? Pharaoh's daughter raised him up as a prince. He was princeling. 40 years on the run after that. Did he kill the... Did he murder someone? He did. He became a nobody. He spent 40 years being a prince. He spent 40 years on the run being a killer, a nobody. And then he spent the last 80, first to the 120th year. He lived to 120, realizing that God can use anybody. I like that. When did God start using Moses? Esther? Which period? First 40 years? Second 40 years? Or the last 40 years? Arguably, the last 40 years, right? No, definitely the last 40 years. But I suppose when he was on the run, God was molding him. The first 40 years, princeling, yeah, I mean, what do you do for God? Not really, right? One day, God was going to make him come back to the Pharaoh after he all, last time used to be fair, fair, whatever, when he go back to meet the Pharaoh at the time, uh, he was looking like wing already, all dark and everything, out there for 80 years. But when he came back, he was going to face the Pharaoh. 40 years on the run because he killed one fellow and Pharaoh was going to kill him. He had to run. After being in the desert for a while, he was going to come back and then he realized God can use anybody, including himself or nobody. When was God going to use him? God was going to use him at a time when he least expect. So I tell people, it's always God using the people who have been broken. Is this some song that says something like that? What's the slide? I want nobody, nobody but you. God will use anybody. But sometimes God only wants Z you to do this. No one else. Something Z you can do, I can't do. Some things I want to do, only I, something you want to do, but God says, I'm the one that's going to do it. Moses was going to be the one that God was going to use. Take a slight way, very cringe. God did not have use of a prince, but of a shepherd. God uses those who have been broken. Go to Exodus 2. Moses had to flee because he killed someone, right? Today I have not much time, running late already. When Pharaoh, Exodus 2.15, when Pharaoh heard that Moses had killed someone, he tried to kill Moses. Moses fled from Pharaoh, went to live in Midian, now a priest of Midian, and he sat down by a well. They came to draw water and filled the trough to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along, but Moses got up, came to the rescue, and watered their flock. Moses became a shepherd. Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock. Moses was, I never thought about it, but Moses was first and foremost a prince. After a while, he became a shepherd. And when did God use him? Shepherd. Brilliant. So for those people who think, I are Daniel, Silas, you all can do this work because you all are whatever, that's nonsense. God used us when we are down. That's why I tell you, it's brilliant. Silas is only used more by God now because he had to go through a desert for a while, whereby he lost his job and he had to go and do F&B. That's the only time I see, God, uh, see Silas serve people together with Winnie in the F&B joint. That's humbling, right? But you learn something from there. Look at Silas now. Look at Winnie now. God has blessed them. Many folk. For me, I've got my problems. Everybody's got their problems. I've got my problems with my whatever I need to deal with. We all deal with it. But God uses somebody. But God will use someone who's been broken. Was Moses broken? He was. Do you think God could have used Moses when he was a prince and what, whatever he wanted? Oh, let me talk to my father. My father, no, let's talk to my grandfather. Pharaoh is my mother. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter is my mother, right? So let me talk to Akong, Akong. Bang se, let the Jews go. No, right? <laughs> he, had to, he had to go and murder somebody. He had to go out to the desert, become a shepherd, and then turn around, come back to face the Pharaoh. God was going to do something. 
for these people. God's theology will work. God is a redeemer. He was going to come. He is a promise keeper. Remember Micah 7, we talked to the book of Micah and then Genesis 50. I talked about Genesis 50 the last time. I said when Joseph was going to die, he says, but Genesis 50, 22, but God will surely come to your aid and take you out of this land to the land he promised on earth to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go to Micah 2, 24. Next slide, please. God heard the Jews groaning. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Verse 24. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. And the rest of it is history. God remembers. I want to encourage you. You think you're suffering now or you're in the desert? God remembers. When, when, when Silas go through the whatever, I remember meeting him. It's like a lot of things were, were whatever. It was quite funny. He says, I think the kids are, you, they all, do you say something like this? The children told you, I think we're becoming progressively bankrupt. That's a new word to me, progressively bankrupt. I thought bankrupt means bankrupt, progressively bankrupt. <laughs> Funny. But God remembers us. God is not, God's theology of work, he, this is his job. No? His job is to protect us. His job is to be a redeemer. His job is to be a promise keeper. So when the Israelites were complaining under the heavy brunt of literally the bricks and slavery, what did God do? God remembered and heard their groaning. And God was going to come again to live with them. I was always so amazed at how we and when we do our communion. And today's communion. What a wonderful time as we come, knowing that God is someone that remembers us. As I invite the musicians to come in, Silas, uh, Karen and, and Esther. As we come before the Lord, as we bring today's sharing on Exodus to an end, I want to invite us to just come before Him. He is a Redeemer. God is someone that will deliver. He is a promise keeper. He remembers, no pun intended, but remember that God remembers you. You, you must understand that. Uh. Dennis, when we go through something, right? You, if you remember that He remembers you, isn't that a comfort? To know that God did not forget you, but God remembers you all the time. And for those of us later, when we take the el elements again, I think the last time you came also, there was Lord's Supper, right? Interesting. One day you will take the communion, my friend. For those of you who have not been baptized yet, maybe you have not said the sinner's prayer, it's okay to let it bypass you, but we respect the occasion as we come, as, as uh, Esther leads us to worship. As we come before the Lord, uh, for those of us uh, who are here for the first or second time, prepare the elements up before you. Just take the elements, and if you believe in God and you have already said the Lord's Prayer, I invite you as we worship the Lord and later we come as a time of communion. Can we just quickly pass the elements to everybody and then we take it from there? I'd like to invite you to stand. Yeah, let's uh, go into a time of worship. Let's pray. Father, we just want to give thanks to you. Father, we thank you that you have given your one and only Son. That through his blood, by his blood, we are washed clean. And not only that, that in our deafness, in our area of death, Lord, you have brought us life. Jesus, we give thanks to you. Lord, as we come before you today, may our hearts, may our mind be renewed and totally trust and lean on Jesus the finished work on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship 
him with this song, Nothing But Blood. What can wash? Christian worker. The, this man had ordered the killing of eight Israelites because the Israelites had killed four Palestinians whom they had accused of crimes against the Jewish people. This brother asked this man, who appointed you judge and jury and gave you the authority to kill such people? This person replied, I'm not a judge and jury, I'm merely an instrument of God's justice. There's a moment of silence and then the Christian brother asked, what place is there for forgiveness? And listen to this. The man said, Forgiveness is only for those who deserve it. Today, as we come before the Lord, know that actually if God were to administer by His court the instrument of justice, none of us should be here. We have found one thing. But forgiveness is something for someone we don't deserve it. Yup, and I don't deserve the things that we have. We don't even deserve to wake up tomorrow and have a breath. But it is because God is with us. So I want to ask you today as we come before the Lord, you may be not, you may have some hatred or in some things like the, the uh, Street Sam's article that the politics of hatred. Whether we are the majority or minority, but when we hate someone where we can't forgive, God cannot use us. Then we cannot do the work of God. So I want to encourage you as we take the elements and just come before the Lord. Will you forgive? And some of us even need to forgive ourselves. And forgive those people who have hurt you. Maybe you need to forgive those people who have landed you in this hot soup, right? But as you bring forgiveness, God can use us. Can we just now come before the Lord? And if you're physically able, I ask you to kneel before the Lord. You have the elements before you. Tear the first layer, the, the, the biscuit represents the body of Christ. And then the, the liquid, the blood of Christ that brings healing to our soul. I invite you to just prepare your hearts, not to judge yourself, but um, yes, to judge yourself and to judge your motives, but to come. Is there any 
unforgiveness because we don't deserve what we have. As we take the communion today, will you just get it right before God? You have 30 seconds thereabouts. Come before the Lord. Get it right before Him, my brother or sister, before you partake of the elements. Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn about your purposes in the olden days and your purposes even today. That, Lord, we are to fulfill the work of the kingdom in times like this. Father, any unforgiveness in Jesus' name will you teach us now as we come before you, as we partake of your body, to release forgiveness for those who have hurt us and even for ourselves as we come before you. If you're ready, I ask you, my brother and sister, will you partake of the elements and just come clean before God? When you're ready, please partake of the elements. Jesus, it was you who bore our cross. And Lord, we give thanks. It was my cross. It was my cross. It was you bore. So I could live in the freedom you died for.
Because when Moses came, Moses was a precursor to Jesus. You see the similarities to what Moses did? Moses freed the Israelites, isn't it? God came to free us as well. As we come to the end of this service, I ask you, will you fix your eyes on Jesus today? As you fix your eyes on Jesus, Jesus is the answer to all the problems. Could even be a financial systemic problem, could even be a relationship, could even be your court case. But as you come before the Lord, I want to pray for some of us here. I want to pray, I want to ask the Shihao to come forward. Some brothers, will you come? TG Wing and the rest. Shihao, can you come? I want to ask to pray for his 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 uh, grab driving. He's not doing so well. He says, I want to pray for him that he will does he does well. TG, will you come? Malcolm, will you come to pray for him? Dennis, pray for his court case. Will you just come? Sister, I know you're here for the first time. If you allow us to pray for you, can you just come? Zed, will you come? I know there's some court case. Again, the people who come to me all got court cases. Otherwise, they won't be coming to me, right? I don't need to tell you about the court cases, but ask us to pray that God will come through for the court case. Just because the court case doesn't mean that we're criminal. Please. But there are things that we need to do. Can I ask us to pray? So I want to invite some of the leaders. Will you come? Pray for my friend. Pray for Dennis. Zed, will you come? Just come. And whoever else, if you feel that God, you need to get right with God, and there's some prayer that you need, will you just come before the Lord and come to the pulpit? We want to pray for you. Zed, will you come? Gun, can you just come? Start praying for them. Come, DJ. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name.
we we'll just lift our hands before the Lord as we bring the end of the service to an end. Father, thank you. Lord, as we come before you, Lord, um, you are our judge. And we will not be judged by men, but ultimately by God when we face you, wherever the time is up for us on this earth. May we not be found wanting, may we be found always wanting to serve you. So I want to pray for all of us here. Lord, whatever we do, may our theology of work be right before you. May we be serving you and fulfilling every purpose you've ordained for us to do on earth as it is in heaven. So Lord, bless us as that banker, as that lawyer, as that army colonel, as that lecturer, as that nurse educator, as whatever that we are going through. And Father, I pray for those who are going through upheavals at work, for those looking for a job or their job is shaky, in the name of Jesus, the God of peace is with you. So the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you so that as you come before Him, know that He's watching over you, that you lack nothing even as you serve Him and you know Him. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. We pray all this through the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you. I'll dismiss you next week.